have your papers, the one last. Um, let me say the following about them. In the, in the question that I gave you, there were two things that, in a sense, involved describing salient features. On the one hand, of what distinguishes the economy as a novel historical formation. So you need to lay that out. We need again to also discuss how Aristotle's treatment of economic affairs involves a repudiation of the economy. So you have to lay out Aristotle's account of economic affairs. Remember, it takes place in different spheres. Some of it takes place within the household. Some of it takes place outside the household. And you really need to cover all of these bases. But then I wanted you to engage in two evaluations. And this is where many of you uh, were less inadequate. First, I asked you to really consider whether the kind of judgment that Aristotle made I'm telling you involves the kind of repudiation of the economy. That I ask you to investigate to what degree that follows from his ethics of the highest good. Does it really follow from an ethics of the highest good? You have to say what an ethics of the highest good is. You have to indicate something of its argument. You have to lay that there and then evaluate whether that way of thinking about ethics necessarily leads one to the kind of conclusions that Aristotle makes regarding economic affairs. It's not very many of you really follow that path. Then I ask you to do something more. That was, in some degree, just asking you, is there really a connection between the way Aristotle judges normatively economic matters? Is there a connection between that judgment and his ethics of the highest good? But then secondly, I ask you to assess his moment of evaluation. That is, is it correct? Now, when I ask you to investigate or assess it, um, maybe saying whether it's correct is probably, probably not the correct term to use. Because I'm not expecting you to have a full-fledged theory that you can justify concerning the normativity of economic matters. But what you can do is be Socratic, that is to say, investigate Aristotle's argument from within, see whether really he has arguments to support his claims. Are his points really consistent with one another? That's the kind of investigation you can easily engage in. So you need to do that. And many of you did not get very far in that direction. And many of you did a very good job up to the point of dealing with these evaluatory dimensions. And I really would have liked you to devote you know, a significant part of the essay to those two evaluations. I mean, you should really think about it as being, in fact, the primary task that you were confronted. So if you have any questions, basically, I I raise questions about what I think you haven't quite answered, or that's quite enough of an argument, or I find things up here. I circle things that are either spelling errors or grammatical errors or something wrong with the wording. And hopefully, you can read my writing. If you can't, you can ask me about it. Um, another thing is some of you use quotations, despite the prohibition. <laughs> Don't do it again. And despite my, my lecture on this stylistic matter, many of you told me what you were going to do before doing it, wasting all of our precious time with an additional page or paragraph, which is utterly unnecessary and completely soporific. So don't do it again, ever, anywhere, all right? No matter what other people tell you. OK, so let me hand out the papers. Which I haven't really come to learn too many names. Peter Mendelson? Yes. <coughs> Gay Peacock? Oh, Randy Brandon Jones? Kyle Nelson? Mm -hmm. 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 
Elliot Purton. William Powers. David Hine. Owen Kendrick. Mark Smith. Amber Seymour. Chelsea Ivey. Carson Shaw. I'll look over my comments when you have a chance. Come and see me during my office hours if you want to discuss the material. And, you know, take into account the gist of uh, my comments in the previous writings on the channel is going well. And um, I'll get it to you not too long. Okay, what I want us to look at today is Marx's discussion of the production of surplus value. And by the way, uh, he places this within a part three, which is titled The Production of Absolute Surplus Value. We haven't yet come to a distinction between absolute and relative surplus values. I'm not going to say anything about that at this juncture. But we'll be coming to that in the meantime and in the place of state enjoying that distinction. But what I want us to begin looking at is a chapter which, you know, we should be expecting to be um, supremely important in the discussion as it's developing itself. Because here, Marx has told us that the forms of commodity exchange make possible not only the development of money and different types of sequences of commodity exchange involving commodities and money, but they also make possible a sequence of commodity exchange that really distinguishes capital from the circulation of your money, and distinguish ultimately what could be considered the modern economy, or what might go under the heading of capitalism, what might go under the heading of the disengaged economy, and what ultimately might be something that is ultimately endemic to commodity relations in general. That is. We've come to a sequence of exchanges where money is advanced, purchasing goods that are then sold for more money, for a profit. And the resources for having such a relationship are available simply in terms of the situation of individuals who meet in the marketplace. But Marx suggests that there is still a mystery as to how there can be an expansion of value. That somehow, even if the exchange relationship makes it possible to buy cheaply and sell dear, it's not that clear how that can happen in an all-pervasive way, simply by relying upon what occurs within the exchange process. And he suggests that if we're really going to understand what underpins the possibility of this distinctive circuit of exchange whereby money takes on the form of self-expanding value, takes on the form of capital, and thereby allows for the emergence 
of individuals who become personifications of capital, that is, engaging in economic activity in pursuit of ever more value. Well, if this is to be made explicable, we have to go behind the scenes of circulation and enter a new sphere, the sphere of commodity production. But the sphere of commodity production is a, is a particular kind of commodity production, because already Marx has been bringing up throughout the discussion talk of individual private producers who expend their own labor upon materials that they have at hand, allowing them to produce articles with a new utility or use value, which they then can throw into the market. And there is already talk of a production of goods that, in a sense, take the form of commodities. But here we're talking about a very specific kind of production, not one of private producers, that is, individuals who are in possession of the means of production and bring to market what they themselves produce. No, now we're talking about a different kind of productive situation, one in which one in which we gain access based upon a particular kind of exchange. The exchange between an individual who is marketing his or her capacity to labor for someone else for a limited amount of time, and someone who purchases that labor power in order to make use of it, to consume it, to set it to work with means of production that that employer already has in his or her possession. This, in other words, is the distinctive relationship between what could be considered the owner of capital and the wage laborer. And what we're here concerned with is the production process that is predicated upon that specific relationship. And we want to understand to what extent that, that particular way of engaging in the production of commodities is of central importance, is of universal importance in the workings of commodity relations. Because that ultimately is going to be the claim that Marx is going to be advancing. That this particular way of producing commodities is a form of production that achieves dominance ultimately owing, allegedly, to the very logic of commodity relations themselves. Now, obviously, we already know that this is not the only way in which commodity production can occur. An individual can bring to market something they have made, and that they have made as a commodity. That is, as something they're not going to consume themselves, but are going to advance in the market to obtain something in return. Here, however, we're speaking about a different kind of production relationship one that is going to be predicated on, on a particular exchange relationship where the participants are, on the one hand, commodity owners, which everyone in the market is. You can't participate in market relations unless you own something that others need and need something that others own. Right? These are features that, in a sense, are going to be um, attaching themselves to anyone who engages in market activity. But now we have an exchange relationship whose participants have a further character, which in a sense is determined by the nature of the exchange. You know, on the one hand, the person who is offering their capacity to labor for someone else. And presumably they're doing so, as anyone does in the marketplace. They have to offer this in order to satisfy their self-selected needs for commodities. And on the other hand, we have someone else who enters the market because they need labor power. They need labor power. What do they need labor power for? Well, specifically, they're going to need labor power not just to be able to produce something that they can then sell to meet their costs of production, now here, what do they need labor power for specifically? If they're going to, in a sense, personify 
what it is to be an owner of capital. What do they need labor power for? To add value to their products? Well, in a sense, not only to add value to their products, but one, one might want to make it a little bit more precise to produce what could be called more value than is contained in the various commodities that enter into the production process. Because as we'll see, um, value can well, allegedly be produced without that production of value being extensive enough as to produce a surplus value or extensive enough to allow the owner of capital who has purchased labor to be able to receive through the sale of the products more money than they advanced in attempting to produce that product. So in a sense we have, you could say, two economically defined um, agendas that are being pursued by the purchaser of labor power, which will make that purchaser of labor power an owner of capital. They're purchasing that labor power so as to put it to work to produce not just utilities, but commodities. That is, utilities that they're not just going to use directly, but they're going to offer them for sale in the marketplace. Secondly, they're going to offer them in mar for sale in the marketplace in order to receive in return more money than they have advanced in entering into production. And when I say more money than they have advanced, we're talking about a production process that follows upon a succession of purchases made by the owner of capital. And what is it that the owner of capital will be purchasing in order for a production process to occur? What is it that will be purchased? Well, on the one hand, we know, of course, labor power. That is that limited capacity of the laborer to be put to work. I should say, to be put to work for a limited time. What other? What other purchases must be made by the owner of capital in order for the production process to, to go into action? Raw materials and means of production. Yeah, in a sense, we, we could say, and when we say, speak about raw materials and means of production, it's a little bit um, uh, somewhat confusing, distinguishing things in those terms, because we can speak, generally speaking, of the means of production as everything that the laborer will make use of in the production process. Now, on the one hand, you can speak of raw materials. What are raw materials? What are raw materials? The Marx will, will, will speak of the laborer. And the laborer, in a sense, will have a subject that the laborer works with. Not a subject in the sense of a person or, or an individual, but some entity that is worked upon. What is raw material in relation to the subject of the labor? Because Marx qualifies raw material. Because there may, might be, in other words, various material factors that are worked upon by the laborer. Some of those will be characterized as raw materials. What does it mean to be raw material? Well, let me make one distinction which doesn't quite answer that question in working upon materials that are one part of the means of production, the laborer may well make use of equipment or tools, right? instruments of production. It can be a global way of talking about that. And the instruments of production can involve not just tools, but more globally, the workshop, the plant, the specific environment that must be made use of um, in order to work upon the material that is going to be altered. 
So on the one hand, we're going to have stuff of some sort that is worked upon by making use of instruments of production, tools and other equipment and the like. But what characterizes raw materials, not just that it's different from an instrument of production, raw material is what else? That is more characterizing. As distinct from, for example, timber in a virgin forest. Well, he, makes, he says something more specific than that, actually. Requires labor. Although it, what? Requires labor. Yeah, in other words, it's a product. It's something that has, in a sense, been worked upon. Even if it's still a material. So he characterizes raw material, the raw, the raw material as something that is itself a product. A product of labor. It's not something that is just immediately present from, from nature, independent of, of, of any expenditure of labor. No, it had to be, some kind of work had to be expended for it to be present. Of course, that would be true even if it was something that happened to fall on the ground. You still had to bring it to the workplace. In some respect, one could say, therefore, there was an aspect in which we're dealing with something that was a product, one might say, globally speaking, of labor, being of labor just in terms of any kind of activity that, in some respects, changes something about the aspect of what it is. So the raw material is itself, globally speaking, a product. Now, I say product because one can speak of product without yet talking about commodities, right? In what respect can one think of something being a product without it being a commodity? Something I would say. What? Something I would say. Yeah, that's exactly it. Something that has been worked upon. It's a product of labor, but it's not something that has been marketed. It's something that might have just been left there and not sold or something immediately consumed by the producer. So, you know, one doesn't automatically want to link being a product with being a commodity. On the other hand, Marx has tended to speak about a commodity form as if it were the identifiable the product. Well, in any event, we're talking about a situation where a production process, excuse me, is about to be pursued following upon an exchange relationship between someone who is selling their capacity to labor for a limited time to someone who will purchase it in order to put it to work to produce a commodity, something for sale, that will be sold for the sake of obtaining more money than was advanced in the production process. Now, money is advanced on the one hand for all of the elements of the production process, which will include labor power, the raw materials, the instruments of production. We're here, in a sense, dealing with a relationship where there are factors of production, and the presumption is that they themselves are commodities, and more specifically, products. Now, of course, when we say products, I've already indicated that that does not mean that they have to have been the outcome of a production process that is based upon a contract between an owner of capital and a laborer. And if you think hard about what is going to ensue after an exchange between an owner of capital and someone selling their capacity to labor for a limited time, although that process may require some material to work upon and some instruments to make use of to be able to work upon it, and that these themselves may be obtained in the market, which is to say they were purchased, they were commodities, that could leave open whether they have actually been produced, but even if they have been produced, there's no necessity that they've been produced by another expenditure of labor that has been purchased by an owner of capital. It could be a private labor. There's nothing about the relationship, in other words, that automatically ensures that the factors that go into the production process are themselves the product of a production process undertaken by capital. Now, I say that because we're trying to think this through in a systematic way and try to think of what is necessarily involved in the relationship. We're trying to, in a sense, construct, in a sense, on its own terms, what is entailed necessarily in this kind of economic process. 
So we want to think about what is or is not necessarily at hand when a certain kind of relationship is engaged in. And I think you find in Marx's discussion often things are pointed to that in a sense need not necessarily be at hand, and yet much of his argument at times relies upon that for certain things that are stuck in the discussion, as, as we'll see. Well, in any event, we're here entering the workplace uh, that is going to be ready to operate thanks to a contractual relationship. And before we enter the relationship and think of it um, in the specific terms that make it the production process that follows from the contract between the seller of labor power and the owner of capital, uh, we just want to focus upon what Marx identifies as the labor process per se. There's a labor process per se that is contained within the production process that operates under the auspices of capital. <coughs> that is generic. That is, it is a labor process that pertains in any kind of economic formation. And as Marx says, we're here simply dealing with the relationship between the individual and nature, whereby, in a sense, it's a transaction of material. One could speak of it as a kind of natural metabolism, where the living individual, in this case the human being, right, could of course be taking place in some other galaxy with some other kind of rational agent, working upon the particular kinds of stuff on that planet, which who knows might be frozen methane as opposed to a carbon-based uh, chemistry, who knows? But you know, the same relationship can apply. We have individuals who have requirements, who have needs. They have to act upon what is given in nature and have to, in a sense, transform what is given to them in order to meet their requirements. And we're not talking about a garden in Eden where things are just ready to be taken. We're talking about a situation where what is given by nature must be transformed. We're talking about, in a sense, not just animal metabolism, which unlike plant metabolism, has to make an exertion to obtain what is not immediately available as a plant can just stand there in the sun and take it as water from the ground and do photosynthesis. No, you know, we are talking about animals who have to exert themselves to obtain factors that are at a distance that thereby have to be perceived and the like. But more than that, we're also talking about an exertion that's going to involve a making, a making. And this character of the labor process involving making has a character that has nothing to do with any relationships between individuals. It can be thought of strictly as a technical relationship, as a relationship between an agent, an embodied agent, as many agents must be, working upon some given material whose form they're going to alter so as to satisfy some end. That's the basic situation. And as Marx says, you know, we don't need to bring in any social relations because here we're talking about something that operates in any context, so long as we're talking about any kind of exercise of technique. So what characterizes it? Well, we have an agent who has a purpose, has some design, has some preconception of what they want to impose upon the material, and they have to act upon that material. They have to make use of their own natural capabilities, making use of chemical, physical, mechanical processes to act upon the mechanism, the physical and chemical properties of the material. But in doing that, they will also make use of an instrument, some other factor which they will interpose between themselves, their activity, and the material, and thereby impose on the problem. Now, in a sense, one could say that to the extent that this activity is intended to be purposive and purposive in the sense of producing something that will meet some desire or need, one can speak in that just general sense of the activity producing something that is regarded by the maker as useful. 
just in the sense that it meets some desire or need. So in a sense, they're producing something that could be said to be something that obtains a utility it did not have before, thanks to the purpose of activity of the agent upon it. Okay. Now, none of this has anything to do necessarily with production of commodities. Right? This activity can take place when there are no markets. These activities can take place on the part of the slave working for a master or someone who's part of a, a particular caste, fulfilling their particular caste duty. Right? This kind of activity can take place within any and every context in which the human agent can be said to be working upon something. And you can see that this relationship is defined, one might say, in, well, one way of putting it is monological terms. It involves a single subject acting upon a thing. <coughs> it is not a process that involves any necessary relationship between individuals. It doesn't involve any dialogue, biological relationship, intersubjective relationship. It's just a relationship of one individual and things. Okay? It's a technically defined process. Well, Marx points out that when we're dealing with the labor process, that is now going to take place, now that Mr. Moneybags has become the, uh, the job provider, is now employing someone and consuming their labor power in the form of labor, the labor is going to be laboring in this very general, generic sense, acting upon some given material using instruments. But what is different is that now this is taking place within a context where, on the one hand, all of the factors of the production are owned by someone other than the laborer. The materials that are worked upon belong to the owner of capital, the employer. The instruments of production belong to the owner of capital. The labor belongs to the owner of capital. Because the labor power has been sold by the laborer. And what the owner of capital owns is, in a sense, the use of the labor power for a limited time. And the use of the labor power for a limited time is the laboring. That belongs to the employer, the owner of capital. So all of these factors that go into the production process all of which would, could be identified in a purely technical way, here have a very specific social form. They are property of the employer, the owner, who will prove to be an owner of capital, not only by overseeing a process which will produce something to be marketed, but oversee something that will be marketed so as to allow the owner of capital to earn a profit, that is, to expand the value that they've advanced in the process. Now, when I speak about ownership, you know, I think we, there's nothing all of that um, interesting about owning the raw material, owning the factors of production, instruments of production, but when we speak about the owning of labor, you know, you want to ask yourself, what does that really mean? Because we're not talking about slavery. We're talking about an ownership of only a specific usage for a limited time of the capacity of the labor. And one wants to think about what kind of normative matters um, enter into that employee. And we'll come to, to look at this uh, in a moment. But it is an issue, obviously. Because here we have a item of property that is very different in character from the other factors in the production process. By the way, is labor a commodity? The labor we're talking about here that belongs to the, to the capitalist, the owner of this production process. Is the labor a commodity? You're saying yes? I, yeah, I think so. I mean, I, is, it, is it something that has been 
brought to market? Or is it something that is going to be marketed? What was brought to market, strictly speaking, by the labor? The labor power. The labor power was brought to market. The capacity to work for a limited time was what was sold. The labor is what happens to the labor power when it's consumed by the capitalist or the owner of labor. It never belonged to the laborer. What belonged to the laborer was labor power. And this is important to keep in mind, as we'll see. Moreover, the laborer, the labor, which is, in a sense, the form in which the labor power is consumed, is not itself sold. It is expended in the production process. It is, so to speak, as Marx puts it, absorbed into the product. It is the product that goes to market, not the labor. So strictly speaking, the labor is not a commodity. What the labor is, is the form in which the purchased labor power is consumed by the owner of capital who is presiding over the production process. Now, the production process, as we've seen, is going to be one that is going to involve these factors of uh, production, one of which is labor power that's been purchased. And one thing to keep in mind is that if, if we consider all of these various factors as having been purchased as commodities, if, in other words, we think of this production process as one by which commodities are going to be produced by making use of commodities, we have to keep in mind that the owner of capital has bought them and bought them at a particular price. So in other words, there is a price at which labor power has been purchased. There's a price at which raw materials have been purchased. There's a price at which the instrument of production has been purchased. Now, Marx invokes his labor theory of value, which he, he, he presented to us early on, within the framework of private producers, very much like Adam Smith did, presuming that the value at which objects are exchanged, commodities are exchanged, is ultimately determined by the socially necessary labor time expended in their production. And he here invokes this again to claim that, in a sense, well, the presumption is that these factors of the production process have been obtained in exchange at their value. And that value is, in a sense, dictated by the socially necessary labor time expended in their production. Now, when we talk about socially necessary labor time, you may remember that Marx, like Adam Smith, had turned to labor time, because allegedly there was a problem in trying to find some basis of commensurability for the exchange of goods, as if the agreement of exchange parties was not enough to allow for their equivalence, for their being exchanged for one another. So there was an appeal to what they held in common. Well, first of all, they have to all be products, which we've seen might or might not be true, but if we grant their products, then the question is what do they share, here, share in common? Well, they were produced Indeed, but they're produced by very different kinds of machinery, each qualitatively distinct, each having a particular form. And that kind of form is exhibited in the generic labor process, where, in a sense, the kind of labor that is exercised is going to depend upon what kind of material is worked upon, what kind of instruments of production are used, what it is that is being produced. Right? You know, you'll be weaving in one case, cobbling in another, blacksmithing in another, whatever it may be, software, design, whatever. You know. All of these will be specifically determined in terms of the nature of the utility, the specific utility that's being produced and the kind of materials requisite for that. So it turns out that the labor that can be referred to as a basis for the commensurability of the products is just as diverse and qualitatively unequal as the products themselves. Precisely because it had to be that diverse in order to produce the diverse products. 
And after all, if products are being exchanged, they are diverse. And the labor's diverse. So then we get these effort to try to find something in common. Well, the labor time expended, but of course, different workers might spend different amounts of time producing the same thing, or of course they produce different things. Right? So there was some attempt to work out an average across society. And that's essentially what was going to be the basis of that. I read this one Marx pointing to this just as Adam Smith had done. Um, and the presumption is that somehow or other that average is what commodity owners are going to be paying attention to when they exchange their products. Now one has to think about why that ought or ought not to be the case. But here Marx doesn't present an argument. He takes this as given and says, okay, we're going to look at this production process, which now is one specifically between an owner of capital and an employee, not private laborers. And we're going to treat the commodities that go into the production process as having been purchased at a value that, in a sense, is dictated by the socially necessary labor time that went into their production. Now, of course, we've seen that when you're dealing with labor power, it's, it's, it's not very easy how you're going to treat labor power as just a product and calculate what was the labor that went into its production. So Marx invokes very much as Adam Smith did, a different kind of measure for the value of the labor power. How is it defined, identified? How is, in a sense, the value at which labor power is purchased determined? Well, it's spoken of in terms of subsistence, just as it was with Adam Smith. And the subsistence is going to be, in a sense, you could say the value of, in a sense, the goods that the laborer needs in order to be able to, in a sense, subsist during the production process and come back again to seek employment. Which, of course, is different from the production of labor power, unless you want to think of it as just having to do with the renewal of labor power for a certain period. Of course, as Marx points out, this is to some degree a conventional factor, not just simply talking about biological requirements. There's to some degree a certain kind of moral element, a conventional element, and what kind of standard of living is required or expected, and that has to be provided. But anyway, the presumption is that this is, in a sense, fixed in these terms. This is a given value. So in other words, we're in a situation where, upon these assumptions, that the price at which the factors of production and the purchase are set by socially necessary labor time on the one hand, there's the raw materials instruments of production, and then subsistence requirements for the labor. We have, in a sense, a measure for how much money was advanced by the capitalist, by the owner of capital, in order to undertake the production process. Right? If you think about it, on one hand, you have the amount of money that's laid out for the raw materials that are going to be consumed in the production process. There's money that has been paid out to purchase the instruments of production. There's money paid out for the labor. And obviously, if we're thinking about the production process as being one that's going to be producing commodities, which are to be sold for a greater value than the money outlaid, we now sort of have, in a sense, our measure of what has to be exceeded. What has to be exceeded through the sale of the, of the product is the amount of money spent in purchasing the factors of production. Now, what complicates matters in terms of thinking about what that amounts to is the instrument of production. Because what is true about the instruments of production in contrast to the raw materials and the way in which they enter and, shall we say, exit the production process? What's the difference? The instruments can be reused while uh, raw materials 
enter the market when they are transforming products. Yeah, in other words, the raw materials are presumably being used up in their entirety in the production of the product. In other words, not only purchases the raw materials that are in fact going to be worked upon and become part of the product or used up in producing the product. On the other hand, the tools and instruments of production are going to be used in their entirety in working upon the raw material, but they will not be used up at the same time that the raw material is being used up. They will eventually be used up, but they have a more extended lifetime. Now this you know, is, is, in a sense, what's going to be the basis for a distinction we looked at earlier, which Adam Smith formulated, between, well, between what kind of capital, so to speak, do any of you remember? One of, one of which being the kind of capital that, in a sense, could be said to be used up entirely in the production process. And the other part being that kind of capital that is not completely used up. But we have, on the one hand, fixed capital, which is the kind of capital that can be spoken of in reference to the instruments of production that are not used up in the production process when the materials are worked upon and the product results. The machinery is still there. It may be wearing out gradually, but it has a fixed character, whereas the raw materials completely circulate. They're purchased. They're used up. We have the product. The product is sold. We may engage in another round of production. We buy more raw materials and so forth. But we don't have to buy new fixed capital or new instruments of production immediately. Their lifetime will be extended. They'll have a determinate lifetime, which will extend over a certain number of engagements in production. So therefore, if you ask yourself, what will it mean for the owner of capital to be able to increase the wealth they've advanced in the production process, how can one think about it in regard to the value that has been, well, laid out, or that has been paid for in purchasing the instruments of production? How can one speak about what the way must be arrived at for there to be what could be considered an achievement in an expansion of value, or a completion of the defining capital circle, which remember here is going to be thought of in the following way. We have money being advanced for a set of commodities which make up the factors of production, then the product will be sold. So we have money buying these various components of the production process, a commodity results, the products, which then is sold for more money than was advanced in purchasing the factors of production. But now we have an instrument that is not all used up, but had to be purchased in its entirety to start the process. So if you want to think about what it would mean for the owner of capital to actually achieve any kind of profit, how do we have to think of this? I mean, eventually, the instrument production will be used up. Well, one way to think about it, you can think of that whole time period, the lifetime of the machinery. During that lifetime, there will be multiple engagements of production, where labor power will be hired and rehired and rehired, raw materials will be purchased, used up, purchased, used up, purchased, used up. And eventually, the machinery will all be used up. At that point, what can one say about what must be true of the sale of the products if there is to be an achievement of value expansion? You have to say that the aggregate value at which the products are sold is going to be greater than what? Then the entire purchase pr price of the instruments of production, plus the purchase prices of all the labor power that was purchased, all the raw materials were purchased. Okay? You can think of it in terms of that, that ultimate result, which in a sense will not be achieved until considerably down the line. But in the meantime, one can think about, well, the depreciation of the equipment. That is, one can think of its value gradually expiring as its utility gradually expired, and one might say, well, thereby one might need along the way 
to gradually take into account the portion of its value that is, in a sense, being lost that one wants to extrapolate and spread out over the lifetime of the equipment and have that reappear gradually in the amount of money made through the sale of the product. So in other words, you have a product being produced. If there's going to be any expansion of value, if more money is going to be returned from what is allocated, one can think of it in terms of the price at which the product is sold has to be greater than the price of the labor power that goes into its production, greater than the raw materials that go into its production, and greater than that portion of the lifetime of the equipment that went into its production. Right? So note how we're thinking about this. We're just thinking about this in terms of this basic desiderata of what must occur in order for this detour into production to provide a link in the chain in the sequence of exchanges whereby the money advanced in the beginning will be returned with an increase. Well, if that is what is going to be, what must occur in order for this to be a circuit of capital, it's the price at which these factors of production have been purchased that tells us what the minimum sale price must be in order for there to be an expansion of value. And ultimately, it's determined by the price of the commodities. And note, that would hold true no matter how that price is arrived at. Minimally speaking, what can one say about the price at which these products, at, at, at which these factors of production were purchased? What must hold true, just given the fact that they are bought and sold? What must be true about the price? Just given the mere fact that they have been obtained as commodities. The price has to be what? No matter which article we're talking about. It has to be agreed upon. It has to be what the seller has agreed upon with the buyer. We know that has to be true. Now, it's not automatically true that we have to think that the buyers and sellers would only agree on a price that they somehow calculate to be equivalent to socially necessary labor time, whatever that may be. But what we do know for sure, automatically, as a necessary ingredient of any exchange process, is that there was an agreement between buyer and seller at some price. Whatever that price is, it dictates, in a sense, the floor that must be transcended in the aggregate you know, sale price of the goods that are produced, if there's going to be any goods. Now, when Marx speaks about the process as a process of producing surplus value, and as an increased amount of value, on the one hand, we're going to be using these factors of production, making use of the labor process that can be defined in any kind of technical situation, as one in which commodities are being produced. Interestingly enough, when Marx speaks about the production of value, he does speak about the values that go into the production process, the values that allegedly are equivalent to the price at which the raw materials, the instruments of production, and the labor power were purchased. But then when he speaks about the production of value, he only speaks about what happens within the labor process. He does not here speak about the sale of the product. Even though at the very beginning he's told us that, in a sense, the realization of an expansion value requires something taking place both within and outside commodity exchange, he here in this entire discussion leaves out of account what happens in the sale of the product. When he's speaking about the production of value and surplus value, he refers only to two things. The values of the factors of production that enter the process and the expenditure of labor within the production process. Allegedly, the expenditure of labor in the labor process is going to do two things. 
It's on the one hand going to preserve the labor, I'm sorry, preserve the value of the factors of production that are made use of by the laborer. Their value is going to be preserved in the product. And then value is going to be, as he says, both reproduced and created by the expenditure of labor. The value that will be reproduced is what value? What value will be reproduced by the expenditure of labor? It's the value of the labor power. That is, the value of the labor power, that's the price at which it was sold, which is allegedly supposed to be equivalent to subsistence as measured by social needs. Necessary labor time expended in the goods required for subsistence. That value, which is the value of labor power, is going to be reproduced in the expenditure of labor. And if the expenditure of labor goes beyond simply reproducing the amount of labor embodied in the subsistence goods of the laborer, then there will be a further expenditure of labor that will be creating new value. So Marx puts it this way, right? I mean, the value of the labor power might be such that the laborer only has to work six hours to reproduce the value of the labor power, the value of the subsistence that will be purchased with, in a sense, the wage. If labor extends beyond those six hours, the additional hours will produce additional value that will then be incorporated in the product. But the product will have then three, in a sense, components in its value. One will be the reproduction of the value of the labor power. One will be the value that is preserved by labor, the value of the components that are used up in the production process. And then the newly created value that will go beyond merely reproducing the value of labor power that has already been paid for by the owner of capital. And that will go beyond, in a sense, the preservation of value that has already been paid for by the owner of the production process who has purchased the raw materials and purchased the instrument of labor. Now the question is, first of all, how does the preservation of what could be called, as Marx called it, dead labor or embodied labor, how is that affected? Marx speaks of it as being a gift of nature. How does it occur? How is it that when the laborer works upon the material using the instruments, producing a manufactured thing that then will be marketed, how does that preserve the value of the raw materials and of, you could say, the depreciated part of the instrument of labor, or the parts of the instrument of labor that have sort of gradually worn out during the production process? How is it preserved? As Marx claims, it is preserved by the late by the expenditure of labor. Now remember, the expenditure of labor is only going to create value if what is true about the product, minimally speaking, what must be true, Marx grants. And this is perhaps the only thing he here brings in that has any reference, really, to the sale of the product. He says it must have a utility. Right? I mean, in other words, the labor process must succeed in producing something that has use. And frankly, we really should specify it in a, in a more particular way. Because when we're talking about use value, in a sense it refers to commodities. We're really talking about something having utility for others in the market. Because it's not of any, to anyone's economic benefit if the only ones who have the use for what's produced are the capitalists, or the capitalists, basically. Because everyone else would have to somehow purchase what it is. Right, we're talking about it has to have use for others, other commodity owners. Well, 
The product must have that character, which is to say it must have a, the working of labor must succeed in producing a new utility, a utility for others, for other participants in the market. Now the question is, why does that preserve the value of the raw material and that part of the instrument of production that could be said to be used up? Is it magic? Is there another way of thinking about the way in which one might look upon the value of the raw materials that are used up, or the labor power, again, or the instrument of production that's used up as, um, in a certain sense, becoming a component of the price at which the product has to be sold? to realize a profit. Well, if you think in those terms, it's obvious, right? I mean, if the, if the product is going to be sold so as to allow the capitalist to be able to obtain more money for the sale of the products than they advanced in the production process, <coughs> the sale price has to incorporate as parts of it the amount of money spent on the raw materials and instruments of production went into its production. And also, it must include the portion of the expenditure on the part of the capitalist that went towards purchasing the labor power. All of that has to be accounted for in the price, or the product will be sold for less than the cost of its production. And that's, a, that's in a sense, the obvious way in which there's a so-called preservation of value. And it's just this. Is required that if you are going to succeed in selling the product for more value than you expended in, in the cost of producing it, well, the price has to be greater than those amounts of your outlay. So those outlays could be regarded as, in a sense, being passed over as a portion of the price. But then we have the creation of new value, which Marx alleges is just going to be thought of as the additional labor time extended, extended in production. It goes beyond what is required to be equivalent to the labor time spent in producing the goods that are needed to, for the worker to subsist. That extra amount of labor time will produce what he calls surplus value. And for this reason, he speaks about the capital that is laid out in purchasing labor power as having a variable character in contrast to the capital that is laid out in purchasing the raw materials and instruments of production. Because their price is allegedly just carried over into the price of the product. Right? The price of the product has to, has to include that or we're going to lose money. But allegedly, the value is being created by the amount of labor time. So here we have something variable. What is variable in the variable capital? A certain amount of money has been paid to buy the labor power. What does that purchase not itself dictate regarding what will occur in the production process? How much is produced? Yeah, how much is produced or also another way of putting it. How much time will the laborer work? Because that is open, or as Mark says, open to some extent. What, what limit is there, of course, to how much the laborer can work? Well, physically speaking, one can't work all day long. One has to rest to some point. Then, as Marx points out, they're not just moral, I'm sorry, not just physical restrictions, but moral restrictions. You might ask, what kind of moral restrictions would there be? This gets us back to the question of thinking about what's special about the conditions in which labor power is sold and then consumed. What kind of moral considerations would go into, in some respect, restricting how much time one works in a way that extends below the limit that one can physically labor? What moral considerations? And think about morality in terms of what is normative or ethical. And if ethics has to do with freedom and exercising your rights, how does the time you work have anything to do with the exercise of your rights? In what respect would it? Yeah, you'd be left enough time outside of the work to be able to exercise the rest of your rights. Yeah, and that's one way he's 
Easy way of putting it, right? I mean, remember how Aristotle described the issue of free time, right? If you want to participate in politics, you need leisure. Of course, he was primarily concerned with uh, the life of the citizen. And then the life of the citizen was a full-time occupation. So you needed others to do all your work. And they, of course, had no time for politics. But now, if we're thinking about rights, not privileges, to some degree, the labor, you know, the, the working day has to be restricted so that everyone is going to be in a position to exercise their various freedoms, one of which is political freedom. But you also have other social freedoms, such as making use of civil courts, making use of engaging in various kinds of social activities. You have your household rights and duties. Right? You need some time for that. Right? You can think in various ways of how there are questions of right that enter into limitations upon the working day. And of course, if you think about this in a further way, you can, you can ask yourself about how not only the length of the working day, but the conditions of the working day might have implications for the exercise of your rights. Because after all, the conditions of labor could be such that they leave you incapable of doing anything else, let alone of living very long. Right. So right, there are ethical questions concerning the safety of the workplace from both a you know, physiological and a psychological point of view. Right? Well, these things have ramifications for your ability to exercise your rights and behave with an autonomous human being in other respects. So you can see that there is embedded in the very character of this work situation normative issues that come into play. If you just were to focus on the formality of the exchange relationship, you could say, fine, okay, Seller of labor power has agreed to some contract. The formality of an agreement is such that it can leave completely open-ended the terms of the agreement. One could agree, obviously, voluntarily, to work 16 hours a day, to work triple overtime, to work in conditions that are extremely dangerous, that will be sure to kill you off, you know, if not this year, soon enough afterwards. It leave you no time to take care of your other uh, rights and duties and so forth. You can't agree to that. But if you recognize that there are these other rights, and not just the right of property, not just the right to engage in contract, then there are other ethical considerations to come into play. Now, Marx himself, at the end of this discussion, points to what he calls a kind of antinomy of right against right. You may remember where he speaks about how, you know, from the point of view of the employer of labor, the employer of labor wants the labor that is purchased, or the labor that is purchased from the seller of labor power, to be employed as intensively, and you might say as extensively as possible. Right? The longer the labor day, the more hard, the harder the individuals put to work, would seem the better, because more products can be uh, produced. But there's an other competing right that Marx puts forward. Namely, the laborer would argue, in a sense, on the terms of the equality of exchange, by saying, look, you could work me like a dog so that I'll only be able to work for 10 years instead of 30 years. And then you're paying me each day, or each week, or each month, what I need to subsist for that month. But actually, what you're doing is you're, in a sense, paying me what will only allow me to survive for 10 years. Whereas I should be paid enough to let me survive for 30 years of work life. So you're really underpaying me. And so Mark says, well, when you have a conflict of right against right, how is it resolved? Force. By force, right? You have force. And so you have the struggle of labor and capital over the conditions of work, length of labor day, pay rates, and so forth, and so on. But one can see that there are also these other normative issues, right? The contractual relationship leaves it open, as Adam Smith realized, although he pointed out, as you may remember, that the conditions under which that exchange takes place tend to favor the employer and make it very difficult for the employee 
to advance their interests, at least individually, even collectively, given character laws and so forth. You know, obviously, these are questions that we need to explore because you can see that there are normative issues here. But one can also see that the market relations themselves leave it open. What will be the terms of the contract? <clears throat> even with regard to the question of subsistence. <coughs> because even though Marx speaks of it as being an assumption of the labor process, that in a sense the laborer will be paid the value of their labor power, and that is fixed and tied to subsistence, you know, the nature of the wage labor contract is such that it's, as a voluntary agreement, the terms that are agreed upon are rather variable, actually. And you can think of all sorts of situations where people are willing to work for peanuts in lousy conditions. Or for more than peanuts in much better conditions. Right? And you can think of all sorts of variabilities. Now, one thing that is a key to this whole situation is Marx's claim that what will ensure that there is a production of surplus value is the length of the labor day. In other words, that the time extended in production will go beyond what is necessary to produce the value that goes into the subsistence wage of the labor. But the question is, what is it about the time of labor expended that could be said to dictate what value the owner of capital receives? Because what is being abstracted from, or what is, what is not being dealt with here, that is obviously a key element without which the process can't achieve what it's seeking to do. What is it? Well, the sale of the product. Right? Is there anything about the sale of the product <coughs> that dictates that the price at which the products will be sold is determined by the amount of labor as measured by the time of labor that is spent in the production of the product? Because remember, the consumers who are out there have to decide whether they're going to accept the price that is being offered by the, by the producer. They're not compelled to accept it. And of course, the producer could naturally charge more than what might be associated with the price, if the price were equivalent to the value, and the value is determined in terms of the expenditure of labor time. And both parties to the exchange, as an exchange relationship, are free to try to get what they can, one way or the other. And if you think concretely about the process, the very fact that this is, shall we say, negotiable, or is not unilaterally determined, is precisely what sets up the situation of competition. Because producers will not have to compete if they can mandate the price at which their products will be sold by something occurring within the production process. Now, of course, there is one thing that is dictated by the production process regarding the price at which the product will be sold. What happens in the production process, combined with what happens in the exchange process where the factors of production were produced, that together determines what the cost of production have been. And that dictates that the price at which the products are sold must be greater than that to earn a profit. If they're less than that, they'll lose money. If they're the same, we'll have non-profit production. But the very fact that the product has to be sold means that the realization of profit is uncertain. It means that one is subject to competitive pressures. It means that there can be no absolute certainty. It means that, in effect, what happens in the production process cannot dictate entirely 
whether and how much of a profit will be achieved. Because all of that will be determined by what price, not just what price, but also what volume of sales will actually be achieved. And of course, Marx, like Adam Smith, both of whom appeal to a labor theory of value, you know, are not blind to that fact, right? That the nature of the market is such that there can't help but be competition. That there can't help but be a problem with selling one's product. There can never be a guarantee that one can succeed, let alone succeed at the price that one wants. Right? Depends upon others in various respects. Which is not to say it's completely indeterminate, but it can't be wholly determined by what goes on inside the production process. Now, if you want to think about that as we move on, think about the ramifications. One thing to keep in mind that's important is when Marx speaks about the production surplus value, he uses a term in connection with it, which seems to have more of an implication. He speaks about the exploitation of labor. And the rate of exploitation is formulated in terms of what is the proportion between the amount of surplus labor and necessary labor or the amount of surplus value produced and the necessary value produced by the expenditure of labor. There is no juridical law in this relationship, and Marx himself points this out. The labor is not something that belongs to the laborer. The labor power belongs to the laborer. The labor has been paying the value of the labor power. The labor belongs to the, to the owner of capital. The owner of capital is not taking something that belongs to the laborer. So we have to think about what, what, why is the term exploitation doesn't really have any other character, despite the fact that there is a relationship of juridical equality, as, as Marx recognizes. Well, we want to push ahead and see what the ramifications of all of this are, where Marx these things is leading, and what really is entailed in this relationship, and what its implications are for the relations of economic freedom. So, I think so we'll, we can do this time. Uh, all of you got back your papers?